Hello everyone, thanks for tuning in. Today what I want to do is give you my first impressions and an overview of combat infantry. So hopefully a little more in depth than just an unboxing. So what I've got here are a couple of baggies filled with the blocks you need for the very first scenario. I should have picked a little bit bigger baggie here. But I'm just set these aside. And that's what I want to do is just kind of talk about our first impressions that we had with playing scenario one, how the rules fit. And the nice thing is the very first scenario includes a little bit of everything. So you get a real good feel for the game. It has your different like machine gun blocks, you know, your different battalion assets even. There's opportunities like here, you know, you get your different vehicles. Uh, now some of this stuff when you set up, and we'll talk about you, you grab some of your battalion ra uh, assets at random. It just says like draw three assets. So if you were going to play this more than once, there is a little bit of, of replay value there because you might not get the same equipment each time. This scenario is pretty much going to be the same. Just some of your starting assets will be different and that might change the outcome of that particular game. So what we'll do, since we're talking about first impressions, is I want to go over the rule book. Now, the nice thing about the rule book is it reads really well. When we said we've got three columns per page of rules, that's not entirely true. So as you can see, like from this example, here on the front, you know, you've got a little bit of an introduction to the game, and then it kind of starts into the rules. So it talks about the game turn sequence. And then this third column, a lot of times, if it's not specifically rules, then it's little side notes, right? Little side note on the combat infantry badge. This is actually an interesting discussion that I saw on Board Game Geek about the name of the game. It used to be called KISS for Keep It Simple Stupid, but later then it was just Combat Infantry, and you know, there were questions, why not like infantry combat or tank combat or you know, why combat infantry? Well, my understanding is because of this right here, it's based on the combat infantry badge. So that's that's where they got the name. I think that's fine. And you read like fog of war ideas behind that, the step reduction. So yes, there's three columns, but that third column is not necessarily, you know, always gonna be dedicated to rules. The other thing too that I really enjoyed about the rule book is everything is really laid out nicely to find and there's not so many different types of counters that you know you had to spend too much time learning about every single counter. It lays out you know some details about your rifle squad, machine guns, mortars, anti-tank rockets, uh, you know it, it's all here and that's the nice thing is, is even though there might be a lot of tank well there's like a few different types of vehicles but once you understand how one vehicle block layout works you figure them all out so again the game comes with enough to represent you know what you would expect to find without being overly complicated just flipping through here and with the nice full color illustrations and examples uh, the map diagram that leads to the second thing I thought as I flipped through here that I was remembering is each page fills out pretty much just one section of rules like so for your maps and the different terrain layouts that's one page then how command and activation works that's another page so the rules are concise so it's not like three or four pages of command or three or four pages of terrain. And then like here's another section on what's not in the game. So just another side notes, right? It doesn't have opportunity fire, doesn't have suppression or facing, hard and soft targets, status markers. What's nice is it actually kind of does have a lot of these things. They just are baked into how the game plays. So like opportunity fire. They have some opportunity fire because when you do, say, an assault, the defender fires first. That represents the defender maybe, you know, shooting at the people charging him. So those things are baked in, but they don't require a whole separate section of rules or interpretations like suppression. Well, since you're dealing with blocks, as you're hitting, you know, infantry, right, 
you are bringing them down. And as they get weaker, their combat effectiveness goes down. But since you have a chance to rally and bring them back, then it's not like this represents exactly so many people are dying on the block. It just means that a certain amount of people are not as combat effective, which could be through suppression or maybe some are wounded or dead. So a lot of those things are just subtly represented here. It's, it's great. Hard and soft targets. Okay, so a lot of games you have a separate set of rules for infantry, and then you've got to learn that. But what's really interesting here is uh, the rules are pretty much the same. Well, let's, let's get an infantry squad here. The rules and the counter information is pretty much the same. It's just that the biggest difference is that for your hard targets, they get this circular number here, which is an armor class. You subtract that from someone's firepower to get their actual to hit roll. So for example, infantry have a firepower of two, subtract five. There's no way that infantry at distance are gonna shoot at and hurt a tank. For example, this tiger tank. But if they were doing an assault, you would lose this armor class value and then they're just uh, going against each other's combat values. That's a very cool thing because now, once you've learned how to play infantry, you can play the tanks. It's just that one little number there makes them an armored vehicle, essentially. Uh, so it's really cool. There, there doesn't need to be a whole separate section on this is how vehicles work, this is how movement works. It's all just part of the same base system. They just have one additional number, which represents their difficulty to kill at range. Then you have your command section. We'll talk about command in a moment here. We'll, we'll cover just uh, an overview of the rules. So then there's a section on rally. So again, easy, just a little section, rally's covered. Now fire combat is the section that takes two pages with a couple of examples, simply because that's the primary function of your infantry is to combat. So this includes line of sight, hexide fire limits, which we'll mention, uh, how to do bombards, including like mortars and whatnot, and what happens with like friendly fire when you do, you know, those artillery kind of strikes. And double defense. That's another thing. There's just so much that's very interesting. They have what's called double defense. So with, with other games, you'll have your terrain effects chart and it will say, you know, if you're in a wood, you get like a plus three defense or something like that. Here, once you hit into those defensive areas, it just says you double the defense, meaning it takes two hits to score a point of damage super easy. You don't have to have a huge terrain chart with, again, a lot of rules explaining, you know, cover effects and whatnot. It's just you either have double defense or you don't. And then certain game effects, like assaults, negate the double defense. You know, easy. Uh, then there's a page here for your special actions. And then again, there's not too many, but there's foxholes, your mines. Even the mines are fun to play with. Uh, dem demoli uh, demolished bridges, smoke, some barbed wire. Again, some side notes on the differences between the American company and German company as far as like how you create squads, which I'll show you real quick because I'm seeing that. The, because this was a question I had, the American blocks, they come with four steps and the Germans come with three steps. And some of the, most of the time the German blocks have firepower three and the American blocks have like a firepower two. Some some vary, you know, just give some variation here. But what this was saying is by this time in the war, because this is talking in, in 1944 time frame, a little bit later war, the attrition had made it so that German squads were a little bit weaker. So this represents nine or so men, and the Americans have about 12 people. And then each step represents about three of those people. So just good, easy math, right? So at full strength, this is about 12 people. At full strength, this is about nine. All right, and then as you rotate, they're either shocked, suppressed, or you know, possible casualties. So again, uh, there's very good explanations as to why everything in the game is the way it is. Uh, then you have a section on movement. Even movement works as you should, you know. That, I think that's the thing that I really enjoy. Everything works in a way that makes sense. I have to admit, I was not, sure how a blog game would work for a World War II, you know, tactical infantry game. But everything here 
really works to the strength of the blocks and it makes sense. So here's your page on, on the assault, assault morale. All units at strength one in an assault must make a morale check at the start of their assault round. Headquarters ignore that. Pass. The unit can fire or treat normally. See, it, the only other thing, just like any game though, is there are some little rules, nuggets that you need to remember. And so the first time you play through, you're going to miss a few things. But even if you miss some of those little nuggets like, hey, a strength one unit before it can participate in the assault it needs to make a morale check. Even little things like that, if you forgot, the game still plays really well. And then finally, there's a section on scenario setup, a couple little notes on solitaire play. And uh, the, oh, this optional rule here, which I thought was interesting, I'm playing it without the optional rule, but it's hits limit. So what it's saying is that um, when you roll the dice, like mathematically, you should be averaging one or two hits with each roll of the dice, right? So if you're an American squad, it's very rare that all four of your dice are going to hit. But there's a greater chance of getting a one or two because you're rolling four dice, right? But this is saying here, if you play with the optional limit, you'll max out at two hits. You know, I haven't tried that but uh, I because I, I forgot that was there <laughs> but it's a small optional rule that I might try sometime uh, then the points value which I talked about in the unboxing so you can create your own scenarios because I think that was one one criticism I don't know if I want to say that I necessarily agree it comes with six scenarios and I know that a lot of folks would like to see a lot of scenarios but I think there's going to be some replayability built into these scenarios because you never start with the same units and your layout can be different. So it's not like you have to put all your units here. They're puzzles for both players to play. So when you're the German player, if you set up a certain way and you see how the American player sets up, well, as a German player, you might say, well, this is how I set up last time because I get um, scenario one here. This, they, they set up first, so they might think, well, you know, I'm going to try setting up this way, this time. So yes, you're playing the same scenario with the same units, but different battalion assets because you draw those, and then your, your setup might change. And then, because the American player sets up second, how they set up in response to how the German defender sets up, you know, you're going to change how you set up. Because this doesn't tell you where units have to go. You know, some scenarios in other games, they'll say you, you got to play a certain amount of units here, a certain amount of units here, and that's how you start up. This is very limited. It just says, you know, here's where the German player sets up on the map, and then the American player sets up on these beach areas. And then how you do that is up to you. Uh, especially if you got stacking limits of three units per beach hex. I play the Americans, and I struggle to fit and try to maintain pl platoon cohesion because your platoon has four squads, right? It has three rifle squads and then one command squad. So part of the challenge was how do I keep everything on the beaches organized? But I'm, I'm going to tell you that that part was great narratively, right? Because this was the uh, June 6, 1944. So this is your, you know, playing off like a Normandy invasion type of uh, generic beach assault. So I can only imagine the chaos they were facing. So I faced a little bit of chaos trying to fit all my units onto these few little beach hexes where they were crowded, right? So I had here this beach area. I just had a lot of my tanks and everything set up here. And then over here, I put some infantry. Now I could have put some vehicles over here because they could go up this slope. That's not a cliff right here. This was definitely some cliffside because of the, the way you had multiple slopes here on one hex edge. So I, I you know, could have driven vehicles out, and, and, but I was trying to clear a nice path so I didn't have to, to try and fight all the German defenders here with vehicles. I was trying to break out from the beach, you know, kind of narratively. And then my son put a couple minefields here and, you know, he had a bunker over here somewhere. So it, it was very fun to see him put all his defenses and then me try to manage all my, my beach space and realty to get out of there. 
So scenario one is actually is a very, very fun scenario to try and play. But we'll talk about we'll talk about some details, specifics of the rules. In fact, let me move this box and we'll have the map set up here a little bit. So the game rules themselves, again, they're not overly complicated. Like any rule set, you're, you're going to make some mistakes your first time out because there's little things to remember. Let's just kind of go through the idea here of how the game plays. So each player is going to have four segments to their turn. So they'll start here with headquarter activation, right? So they have the command segment, their action segment, which could either be like rally, fire, you could do a special action like dig a foxhole, blow a bridge, and then there's the movement, and then there's the assault segment. Well, four steps there, all right, and then there's like a, a wrap up once you switch over to the other person. Um, so when you do the command activation, so one thing I really like about the game, I just I just pour the blocks out. Let me let me take a second to organize a company for you to look at. All right, so what I've done is I'm just gonna shift this map a little bit here, get it on camera a little better. There we go. So what we got here, this is a sample company right here, and for this first scenario, this is not all the blocks assigned to the American player, but most of them. So what you got here is your company commander, and they're labeled by like company um, for Alpha, and you're gonna have like Bravo Company, you're gonna have also a Charlie Company. So the game gives you a battalion to play with, so you're gonna have three companies. Now, for this first scenario that you would play, this is gonna be you know using Alpha Company. So then your company is broken down into three platoons. And then each platoon is comprised of a command block. So this is your platoon headquarters. And then you have three rifle blocks. And then these represent the squads that make up your platoon. And the squads themselves are not individually numbered. So it's just, you know, here's a squad, here's a squad. But your platoons are numbered, right? So each block then is assigned to a platoon number. So I've got my three rifle squads and my command platoon that makes up third platoon, right? So here's third platoon, and this is, you know, a squad within that. So it doesn't matter if it's first squad, second squad, third squad, they're all interchangeable, but three squads that comprise third platoon of Alpha Company. And then you have second platoon, and then first platoon. <clears throat> so that's one, <coughs> excuse me, one aspect then that I really enjoyed of the game was it brings in that chain of command aspect. In a lot of squad level games I see, that cohesion is not really baked into the counters or the game. Sometimes that's in the scenario. We'll just say, hey, this is elements of you know this platoon of this company. But this is actually showing you, okay, I'm dealing with Alpha Company. And then we have the support units. And what's really cool is you also then have attached off-board assets of aircraft or artillery. Now, let's just kind of start here at the top, <coughs> work our way down a little bit. So when it comes to, say, the off-board artillery or off-board airplane, the strength on here is just a marker for how many times you can call on that asset. So the scenario number one says you're gonna, the American player gets two artillery points, essentially. So I would just keep this on the two, and then when I use it, you know, you just rotate, you got one left. So the max that you're going to have, because I only see one artillery, off-board artillery asset, is going to be, you know, four. And the scenario might even say what this represents, because again, it's off-board. In scenario one, it says this is your destroyers out at sea who are laying down some bombardments. And then the strength is three dice at firepower seven. So every roll under a seven is a hit basically, right? And then this uh, lets you know that that's a bombard asset, the little red triangle. So artillery is easy. And then uh, aircraft, same way, right? You're gonna be assigned a certain amount of sorties that you have, you just rotate. And then uh, their strength is four dice at a firepower of six. And then, you know, there's some rules that say, you know, if uh, you're attacking, it might have their armor class, or get rid of armor class if it's vehicles, or half the armor class for a bunker, because it's, you know, 
hitting the tops of vehicles, right? So you got some special rules on how they inflict damage. Then you have here your battalion assets. So this little yellow triangle says that's a battalion asset. That's important because only certain headquarters units can activate a battalion asset. In the case of like tanks and you know just battalion assets in general, it'd be your platoons. Your platoon headquarters could activate battalion assets like tanks because they're right down there with those guys providing support. You know, so if, if I had an area where I've got a bunch of infantry working, I might have this uh, Wolverine here, my nice anti-tank little destroyer going along. This platoon guy can then, you know, say, hey, I need you to, you know, go attack this or, or whatever. So they kind of work together out there on the field. But any platoon headquarter can activate this asset because it's assigned to the battalion. Now, your other assets here, they're not assigned to the battalion. They're assigned to, at the company level. These would be activated by, like, your company commander. And what's very cool is, and this makes a lot of sense, when you're moving your troops out there in the field, your platoon commander, right, is then right down there with the squads directing their actions. And so they have a command radius of one hex. Your company commander, you might keep him back from the action a little bit, and he can activate any three units on the field anywhere, right, because they have like radio communication and stuff. So my company commander, for instance, he could activate say uh, a bazooka team or a mortar team if there's you know line of sight or machine gun so he activates all the assets assigned to the company now your platoon commander he could probably activate these assets as well um, but this is really important because it gets you again to think about your setup who's supporting what so in this game you don't necessarily ever have a bunch of vehicles just drive around the map taking care of business for you they actually need to be near the troops that are supporting them or near the troops they're supporting. So again, the game just has this real built into it system of keeping cohesion without being overly complicated. It just says, you need to be activated by a platoon guy. Oh, well then I need to make sure I have my platoon headquarters units near things they can activate. Otherwise, you can't activate a battalion asset. Now, if you had, for example, a situation where your platoon headquarters is off on one side of the map and for whatever reason, it's a, one of its attached squads is somewhere on a different side of the map, they do have a morale value that they can roll to see if they activate. But battalion assets, they have to be directly commanded by someone in order to actually do something. They'll defend themselves in assault, but like they won't actually go drive off and do stuff unless one of these platoon commanders tells them to. So again, real simple command and control system baked in by uh, little identifiers for who's attached to what, what's a company asset, what's a battalion asset, and who can control it. All right, so that's your command phase. You activate like your platoon headquarters, and then he would activate everybody assigned to him and then you go to your next. So this doesn't do alternating activations. This is one side will activate all of their units. Once all their units have been activated, then it goes to the next player. All right, so it's not a alternating activations back and forth. There could be a house rule someone tries at some point, but the rules as written is you would activate all your stuff and then your opponent goes. All right, so after you activate a, uh, your platoon headquarters and all their squads and attached stuff goes, then it's like, what do you do, right? That's where you get into, after you do your command activation, what are the actions, right? So rally, uh, again, if they make pass a morale check, then they can regain one step if they've taken some damage. That's why, that's why the suppression idea is kind of baked into it, right? Is the step loss isn't permanent. So if I pass a rally check, I can just, you know, if I have my wounded guy here and I pass a rally check, then you know, I just stick them right back at full strength four. All right, so that's how suppression is kind of baked into this. Uh, if this were to actually represent you know casualties, right? You could never perform any rallies and bring them back. So that's why that's kind of baked in. Uh, let's see. Then there's fire. So the other thing I can do is fire with folks. That's actually pretty easy too. The combat in this, it a lot of it makes sense. Like let me just take a moment to wipe that away. And let's just take a look at a couple infantry blocks. I kind of like, 
I'm really starting to like the idea of blocks over counters. I will still enjoy counters, but I just like the fact that there's a little bit of heft to these. Uh, so when you're map, I don't have this laid out all the way, but at least they're not like flying all over the place like with counters. Uh, anyway, so the active player, then, you know, if I activate someone to fire, you just look at the little fire symbol up here. It says F2. So that means um, when I roll dice, the 10 sided dice, I would have to get a two or less to inflict a casualty. And then their step number is how many dice you roll. So with this, right, at full strength, since a, a German squad has about nine people, they're gonna roll three dice. Whereas your Americans, because they've got, you know, 12 people, and each step is about three people, they get to roll four dice. So if I was, for example here, let's say they're actually in their little hexes, and the German player was firing first, I could roll three dice, and we'll take a look at some results here. Just thought I'd bring the camera in a little bit closer so you can see things a little easier. All right, so for my German player, I rolled horribly, right? None of that is a hit, because they need a two. Uh, and then the American player, they also need a two. So if the American player was firing, you know, same thing, again, no hits. I do, I do have to say that one of the things, I did a lot of dice rolling. The games take two to four hours, is what it says in the, in the box, and I think a lot of that just comes from the fact that on a 10-sided die, Getting a two is pretty tough. Plus, if your German or opponent is in a defensible hex where they get that double defense, you have to score two hits in order to do a point of damage. So again, if my American player, oh, I lucked out. I scored two hits, but I would only get one rotation on the block instead of two. All right. So sometimes, even though you're rolling four dice or three dice, it just feels like it's really hard to get a one or a two. And then when that's why it's real important that you have access to your battalion assets because they generally have a lot more firepower. Like you got a tank, or not a tank, you got your Jeep, 50 cal machine gun Jeep. It has a firepower two, or you know, two dice that it will roll, and it's got a firepower four. Oh, right, well that's, that's better odds. You know, okay, that's one hit, but because my enemy here is in a defensible block, <coughs> you know, that's not enough to kill it. And those those damages don't carry over. So if, if I don't do two points of damage, it, it's negated, right? You know, it's, they're in cover. So I had to admit though, there, there were times I felt like I was just rolling dice and rolling dice and nothing was happening. But I think that narratively works because apparently it takes a lot of bullets being shot to actually hurt and suppress wounded and wound people. Uh, so I guess that makes sense. It just kind of made the game seem a little tedious at times. Even though, you know, you, you might be rolling four dice, the fact that you got to score ones and twos a lot of times makes it kind of a, a chore. But, again, it's real simple to play the game and figure that out. You know, one other thing, too, that they did to eliminate a lot of counter to mark, like, if they've moved or fired and done different things <coughs> is... When your counters are up, you know they haven't activated. When you activate them and they do something, you just lay it down, and now you know, okay, I fired with them, or they've moved, or something like that. And then when this block does something, it's the same thing. Uh, so you don't actually have to keep putting markers and status markers saying that they've moved or they've fired. It's just how you have the block situated will let you know what they've done. Like it says here, when you move, you can just rotate your block like a 45 degrees, and then you'll know that it's moved, you know. Some, some of that I didn't really do. We, me and my son, we played. We kind of knew which ones moved or fired. Because there's no modifiers to <clears throat> affect defense or spotting or anything like that if something has moved or fired. So if we just lay it down, we know that that block has done something. Um, let's take a look here. So you do your action. And you're done. And you only get one action. So it's either you move or you fire. There's no moving fire and things like that. Because again, these are 100 meter hexes. 
we're not so zoomed in that we really care about the specific taxes of what they're doing. You're a battalion commander, and so you're just issuing orders down through the troops. So you're just kind of zoomed out a little bit. So you either move or you fire. And uh, again, then you've got like, you can rally, you can fire, do the special move, like dig a foxhole. Foxhole was probably the only rule that I think I might ask on Board Game Geek if they could specify. My son had like three units in a hex. It wasn't this hex, but it says you can only bit, dig foxholes in a clear hex. So for example, he had his stacking limit of three, and it says a foxhole only covers two people. Uh, so he dug two foxholes in a hex. I did not see a limit in the rules on that. I may have overlooked it, but uh, so I let him dig two foxholes so then he could support you know all the folks and then the foxholes stay, they don't go away. Um, but if that's the case and you can dig a whole lot of foxholes just for the sake of digging foxholes and get that double defense, I'm gonna need a lot more foxhole counters <laughs> because there was only like, I don't know, four? Let's see, I see five, six. So it's possible I only have six foxhole counters. So I think that might be the only rules ambiguity that I was like, mm, I'd like to know for sure. Can I only have one foxhole? There might be a, I don't want to reread it right now because my first impressions, but there very well could be a sentence in there that says there's only one, one special counter per hex that I overlooked. Uh, but as it stands, you could probably just go ahead and say, yeah, I've, I've, I've used up all the foxhole counters. You can't dig any more foxholes. I stuck them all in this one hex. But it only cover. It doesn't matter how many people it covers there, Jack. I've used up all your foxhole counters. So that, that might be something I research a little bit more. Uh, so why did I mention the foxholes? Because uh, that just came to mind as a special action. And then move. Oh, so here's a cool thing with move and fire, and then we'll talk about assault. With move, this is a uh, idea of the game I thought was fantastic. You don't move into a hex based on the terrain of the hex, right? So like a lot of games you would just look at where the dot lies and that tells you what kind of hex. So the dot here, center point of the hex is woods, that's a woods hex. Center dot here, that's a clear hex, even though there's bits of a city and a road. Uh, here you've got beach, for example, another forest, and this would be like a little farm. When you move, you don't move into the hex and pay the cost of the terrain of the hex, you move in and pay the cost of the terrain that's on the hex side. I've not played a game like that before and uh, it's actually really, really brilliant. Let me show you an example in the rule book of how this works. So this example picture in the rule book, I mean, shows it perfectly. So let's say you've got this town hex right here. So if I was going to move out into one of these other areas, you just got to look at the hex side and all of the map spaces are laid out to where there's no question so far that we have found what hex side terrain you're moving into or, or across. So these maps are laid out really, really well. So for example, if I'm here and I want to move south, that's clear because it's a clear hex side. If I was going to try and cross to this area over here through number four, that's a river hex side because the river goes right on the hex side. And sure enough, when I look at the map, like I'm just gonna randomly show you a spot on the map, look at that. The rivers follow the hex, hex sides. Yeah, so they, they have planned this thing together great. So there's not questions. If I was gonna go this way, that's another town hex side, right? So I got to pay the cost of crossing a town hex. There's a forest hex. There's another river hex. There's a river, but it's got a bridge. So a bridge hex side. And it's brilliant. You just look at the terrain chart and that's on the back of the book. I'm going to actually make a copy of this so I don't have to, because the one thing I found when I was going back to look up rules and I kept coming to the back here, this is the player aid chart. This is the player aid chart, right? That's another random thing to skip to. This is it. Just reminds you your, your headquarter activation, you do your action, then you do assaults, and then here's your train effects chart. That's it for the game. <clears throat> it's simple. Uh, so if I'm moving into clear, I can have three units stacked in it. It provides a regular defense of one, doesn't block sight, and it's two movement points. 
which, you know what, I should do better remembering that in the future because when I was playing with my son, I was letting other games hit my mind where clear terrain is just a movement of one. So I think our units were moving a lot further than they should have. Now this is something here, fire and assault, which I said I'd, I'd talk a little bit more about here after I did movement. But the movement's that easy, right? You just get, you have movement points on your block, like right down here in the corner. So infantry could move, you know, essentially two clear hexes, 200 meters. That, that makes sense, right? They're not Olympic sprinters yet. Um, but yeah, I was making these guys, <laughs> they could run. I was uh, one movement point per clear hex. These guys were racing across the map, but I, I need to fix that next time I play. But anyway, where was I? Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, so here, fire and assault. Just another great concept that took me a second to figure out. If I've got a, a stacking limit, let's find a clear hex, right? So here I've got three squads. Bam, that's my stacking limit. And they've got their, I'll just grab somebody, and their platoon sergeants over here. And he says, fire, fire at this German squad. Okay, that's all legit and good. We can do that. However, <clears throat> the way the game is working is it says on about that 100 meters of, 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 of your hex side, well, I guess the hex across is like 100 meters, but you can only have a certain amount of people realistically fit across one hex side. Yes, you could, if everybody was just kind of scrunched together, you could probably say that all squads were on that hex side and they're firing across. But realistically, troops were never scrunched together. They spread themselves out a little bit. So the game says, okay, well, depending on the hex side terrain, you can only, say, have two people shoot out of that hex side. Or, in this case of clear, it says assault, you can do two people. So what that means is, across a clear hex side, I can have two squads charge across in that movement segment. Um, I, that's one thing that took... I had to keep referring back to to make sure I knew how many people could shoot out of a hex side or how many people could assault across. And I'll tell you why that was cool. A little frustrating at first because that's not a concept I'm used to. Usually if I've got a game like this and I've got three units stacked in it, those three units are going to shoot or assault or move or do whatever they want. Uh, it's not that way here. So you know, if you've got a woods, let's see, like cemetery, Cemetery, only one squad should, could shoot through a cemetery hex side, or only one squad can do an assault across. So what that does is if you've got your three folks, <clears throat> then in a way, they can coordinate with one another. So you could say, well, since I can only have two go across to assault, I might activate him and he'll shoot and maybe he'll weaken this guy a little bit and then when these two come across to assault, they're now coming in at full strength and they're getting him because he took a point of damage. You know, so in a way, it kind of gets you thinking tactically in that sense. Or if I desperately, desperately want all three of these units to assault because my stacking limit for a clear hex is three, I might have him here go in. Maybe, maybe I'll have two go in from this hex side. I might have to move him, okay, one, two, for moving into clear, and then one, two more points to move over here. <clears throat> so he might have to come in from a different hex side. So in actual gameplay, as inconvenient as that may sound, it actually gets you thinking about maneuvering. And that, again, that's just another great subtlety built into the game rules that simulates things that you would do in real life, but you don't have a whole lot of rules for my guys have to really think about how to best utilize their movement and where they go. Even with the, the platoon commanders, like that's something too. Uh, with your platoon commanders, as your troops start to move around, they have a little bit of leeway as far as like moving and what they can do. So the way your command units go, so if these were all alpha two, which I think they aren't, let's just say these are all alpha two, I don't wanna dig through the blocks. So if I activate this guy and they all belong to him, one thing you can do is, is let's say they've moved previously and my, my commander's down here. 
Well, <clears throat> when you activate your platoon headquarters unit, he gets one free move if it's through a clear hex side or a road hex side. So I could give him one movement, because you know, they're riding around in Jeeps and stuff, right? And he'll start yelling at them to do their stuff. So okay, you two assault, and you come here and move, and, and you're all in there to assault. Once all of his attached squads and he's done activating everything he can activate, he then gets a turn himself. So then he could either move so he's still up close to the action or he could do something. Um, so at least your, your platoon headquarters has some flexibility as your men start moving around. And that's, that's, that's all part of like your movement or he could attack if you wanted. So just looking at actions. So there's a lot, a lot you can do with your blocks in those action steps. And then let's talk real quick about assaults. So assaults are pretty good. So if I did actually move all three units in, uh, the way I understood assaults, the way I understood it, I'm sure if I go back and reread the rules, I'll, I'll get a different understanding. But the way that I understood it was, let's say I had two defenders. Assaults works on three rounds that you do. The first round, there's actually a little saying, uh, I'll tell you, a player A chart with some of this stuff would be great. But essentially, there are several steps to the assault. The defender will fire, so he fires or retreats each unit that he has, uh, except in round one you can only fire. You can't retreat in round one. Then the attacker can fire or retreat. Um, Oh, only AT rockets may target units in assault rounds. Hits from other units are applied to the highest step unit normally. All right, so like for example here I've got firepower three. So the German in this case is defending. So he's going to roll his dice. I rolled him off camera here, but he scored no hits. This unit will roll, and they're firepower two. They're a little bit weaker. And they score, oh they did, they scored two hits. Now, the way the rules are for combat is when you score hits, whether it's rifle combat or, or uh, you know, bombs, things like that, is you take the damage off the highest block. And if there's a tie, then the defender, the owner, gets to decide. So I took two hits, so I'll take a hit off of here and a hit off of here. <clears throat> All right, that's the defender's firing. Now, that represents that they were shooting possibly as people were coming up. See, again, that's why I said you don't need opportunity fire necessarily because we assaulted from different hexes. Now we're in the same hex. That's why the defender gets to shoot first. They're opportunity firing at the people coming up. Then the attacker would make his attack. So he got dropped down to three dice. He still has firepower two. I rolled a one. Uh, so then the German says, well, I'll just take a hit off of here. And then this squad would go, got nothing. And then this squad, which is up to full strength of four, you got no hits. So that's why I said sometimes it feels like I'm just rolling dice all the time. Uh, then you would go to the second round, and then the defender could decide to retreat or keep shooting. Well, he didn't really do too bad, So, but now he's only got two dice on that guy. He didn't score any hits. Three dice on the remaining person. Didn't score any hits, right? And, and then they, they would take their second round, so he got three, no hits, three, no hits, four, oh, two hits, two hits. So I have to take one off of the highest, and then the odd hit, uh, those are equal. He would just, I'll just take it off that guy, right? Then this is the third round of combat. Um, in the third round, again, the defender can either retreat or fire. But here's the thing, he, he's going to fire, he's going to stay, and I'll show you why. He, he rolls a four, misses. This guy's down to two. He rolls, got nothing. Now, on the third round of combat, the attacker has to retreat. So when you assault, and you got three rounds of combat, the person assaulting only gets to roll attack dice for two. So if I don't take these guys out in those first two, I have to retreat. And either I can retreat, you know, back into friendly units or, or empty, empty spots, as long as I, I don't violate stacking limits. Now, that's fun. I mean, this was great. We had a lot of fun doing assaults. Like, I, I really wanted to do a lots of assaults, so I kept stacking guys in so you could do assaults. And you really got to think about, you know, do I, I need to bring as many people as I can, you know? Uh, but yeah, so assaults works out easy. Even assaulting a minefield, it's similar. Uh, minefields, 
let's see, I got a minefield block here. Minefields are cleared by assault. And uh, so if I brought in, say, an infantry unit to clear it, and I've got my four dice, they only take one hit. They don't actually attack. What they do is they attack in the clearing. So if I rolled, I got firepower two, so I, I hit. So this group successfully cleared the minefield. Well, for every zero or nine that you roll, the person clearing would take damage. Um, so you would think, well, that doesn't happen too often. Well, the first time I cleared with infantry, I, I, I took two step losses before I cleared the minefield. So that's bad. But how does that affect vehicles? I know, I feel like I'm just hitting random thoughts, but I tell you, the more I think about the game, just the more really cool stuff comes up. See, when you do assaults with vehicles, they don't get their armor class. So like if I had this Wolverine and they were attacking this German unit, they're just as susceptible to taking hits as the squad because you don't get the armor class. So when the German unit at three strength attacks, I scored, oh my goodness, if this was say a firepower three German, I scored three hits. So I would have to take one hit, two hits, so they're both equal. Then I have to decide, what do I take my hit off of? Uh, I guess I'll take it off of here. Because they lose the armor class. So how important is my infantry squad or my vehicle? Right? It's great. So that's how they assault minefields. If I drive a vehicle into a minefield and they say, yeah, I'm going to clear it because I'm going to attack it. So I'd roll my two dice. Oh my gosh, I did. I rolled a nine. This tank, well, the Wolverine anti, you know, tank. He just took a point of damage and the minefield is still there. <gasps> you know. So again, simple mechanics. Yeah, minefields can be devastating. Engineers get bonuses though, of course, engineers. Uh, boy, yeah, I tell you, the more I talk about it, the more fun things I think about. I'm just gonna say, until maybe I do a game playthrough where you can see the mechanics in action better than just kind of randomly throwing thoughts together, you're not gonna be disappointed with this game. I really don't think you will be. The rules are easy. Uh, just a few things to remember so you don't forget, you know, like when you do assaults, uh, only the anti, you know, the bazookas and things get to pick specific targets. Yeah, yeah, I did think of one of the things I'll show you. Uh, this really hurt me on my beach landing. When you have vehicles, I've got two vehicles here. I had them on the beach because that's where they got to land. And my son, he had his bunker. Uh, his bunkers on one of these flipped over. Here it is. Boom. So I had two units down here on the beach. And he had a bunker. And uh, they're up. So they weren't revealed. The bunker's always revealed. Well, when you shoot at vehicles, and let's say you had infantry in here too to support them, right? Vehicles don't get their armor class value when they're in this like hidden state. So when his bunker and some of his defensive units were shooting down into my stacks of vehicles, they all took damage equally to the, you know, as if they were infantry. And the reasoning behind that is it's saying that your crews aren't prepared, maybe they're not buttoned up. Uh, so you're like hitting the crew, not necessarily destroying the vehicle itself. Mm. But if your vehicle is revealed, then if this bunker is shooting down into the hex, he has to decide. Am I attacking a specific unit, which then I'd have to worry about armor class, or am I shooting the hex, and then only the uh, non-armor class units are affected. So depending on what you're doing, you might just want to drive around with your vehicles exposed at all time, unless you're trying to feint and fake out your opponent and move vehicles and then boom, at some point you say, oh look, I brought up wolverines and tigers and panthers. You didn't know I did that, but I did. That, that was the only thing that's kind of uh, wonky too, was trying to remember was, oh shoot, when my tanks are upright and hidden like this, they take a lot of damage. But other, th other than that, just like I said, just remembering those little nuances, the game is incredibly good. And it does take a while to play. Um, you know, that two to four hour mark, is not unrealistic and of course as you and your face-to-face -face opponent learn the game more that time gets better but just starting out 
yeah, it, it's going to take a while to remember a lot of the little little details that make this thing run, such as I can only have a certain amount of people shooting across a hex side or assaulting from a hex side. Remembering that I activate my headquarters exactly, can they activate battalion assets or just company assets? You know, assaulting minefields, don't forget to take damage on your zeros and nines. Little things like that, don't forget to equally distribute damage among your vehicles when they're face up versus if you keep them face down so you get their defensive bonus or when to lose that armor class like they don't have the armor class value when being assaulted because the guys are climbing on your vehicles and dropping explosives into the engine well and whatnot um, so yeah good thematically fun game could this be a simulation I know a lot of people will compare things to Advanced Squad Leader, which has hundreds of pages for simulating a lot of minutia. No, this doesn't have that. But does this do a good job of simulating or replicating a lot of those things baked into the, the mechanic? Yeah. Like I said, it's amazing that there's no, no necessarily separate suppression rules or opportunity fire, but yet just the way that combat and some of those things work out, it's like, it's there. They're kind of just baked into those mechanics. Like for example, when your attacker does an assault and they only get to fire for two actual turns, but the defender can fire on, on round three, and then the attacker has to retreat on round three, it's because, well, that's just simulating the fact that these guys are running away and the defender is shooting them in the back. You know, so those rules are all there, and you don't really have to think about it. Uh, yeah, it's great. I tell you what, I get, I'm just giving you my thoughts, and I know it kind of rambled through as things came to mind. But as you can see, there's a lot of game here. Look at the rules; they're free online. So if you go to the Columbia Games website and look at their combat infantry section, you'll see they got a link to the rules PDF. They're going to be living rules right now. The rules as of this recording our version one uh, so go there check them out for yourself and you're going to see it's an easy read simple mechanics and a lot of replayability as far as the scenarios would it be nice to have more scenarios i'm pretty darn sure that they're going to release more scenarios i would not be surprised if they put some free scenarios out to support the current game or you're going to see some scenario packs maybe in the future you can purchase but uh, there's going to be more. And then again, when you have your rules for creating your own scenarios based on points for the different units, which I, was a thought that I had as well when I was looking at this. The points here for the units are not for the unit, it's for the step. So if you've got, say you want to buy a Tiger Tank at three steps, and if it's like 13 points per step, and you say, well, I'm just going to make a scenario that's 100 points, I might buy a Tiger unit that's not coming in at full strength. Yeah, I might buy a Tiger unit that comes in at step one because it's going to be a scenario about a, a wounded vehicle the Germans are trying to reach or something, you know. Uh, so there's even flexibility in how you create scenarios. There's just a lot of a lot of possibilities. That's what I'm going to say. This is the possibilities game in a good way. Lots of possibilities for growth and even, like I said, just within the one box. You get like what 133 unit that's like 77 units per side so you got a nice variety of infantry some vehicles uh, all the way up to a battalion so some of the games you actually get to field out your your full three companies and battalion assets so you can still have some pretty big battles or even just down to you could probably make a stair where you're just running a few squads through something uh, so again this is really a possibilities game and if you've taken the time to watch all this, thank you so much. Leave your thoughts on the game. Hopefully, uh, you know, maybe you've seen, seen it, played it. What did you think of it? But that's it. Like I said, this is more of an overview, kind of a video blog, me just rambling on about it. But I hope you enjoyed what you saw. And if you do pick up the game, let me know. And then tell me what you thought of it. And I'll talk to you later. Thanks a lot. Bye.